Welcome to Circuit Analysis. In the last video, we looked at using PSPICE from the command line. And in this video, we're going to be looking at using it through the capture interface. So besides the previous video, which I'll put a link in the description, there's a couple other prerequisites that I'll put links to. And we're going to be first looking at libraries and parts, and then drawing an example circuit, checking out the symbol properties and how they link with the PSPICE models and do direct pspice injection and uh, use the model editor the built-in one and i'll talk about why i don't really use that and then check out the simulation profiles and how those work and talk about some tips for getting complex models to converge here's capture so the first thing to do is link up the libraries i've got this example circuit set up but i'll delete it and redo it so press p for the shortcut to place a part and these are the current libraries right here. If you don't have these, click the plus to add a library. And here we're in the pSpice folder. Up one level is this folder. These guys have a lot of uh, parts without pSpice models, but all the ones in the pSpice folder have pSpice models. So the first one to look for is the analog one right here. So I'll add that. I've already got that. The second one is the breakout right here. And I've got that. Third one is the analog behavioral models. So that's ABM right here. And let's see, special right here. And then sources, this one right here. The only one I don't have is this analog behavioral one. I'll add that. Next, I'm going to create a new schematic and I'll just call it palette. Sometimes I like to make one over here, give it a new page uh, just to store things that I'm not using. So I'm going to control X this whole circuit, put it over here on this page, double click over here, control V. So this is just saved here for reference. Now, you'll see these little stars over here. You can do Control S to save if it's not working. You can click on the top level here and then Control S to save and then all the stars go away. So I'll go back to the first page. This one's blank now. And this is the circuit that we drew last time. So this is what we're gonna draw. And here are some hotkeys we're gonna be using. So you can do all these from the menu at the top but we have P for placing a part, R for rotate, H for flipping horizontally, W for creating a wire, N for labeling a net, T for adding text, and D for deleting anything that's selected. I'll start off by placing the op amp. So we're going to need to add a new library actually for that. It's this one called op amp. And in there, we'll look for a 741. Next, we need some DC voltage sources. So go over to this sources, delete this search. And you can see all of the sources in here. But an easier way to find sources is through this place and then pSpice components. Down here, there's sources. And we want a voltage source DC. So put three of those. Next we need two resistors and a capacitor. I like to use this place pSpice component whenever I can because it's a lot easier. So I'll do resistors and click R to rotate it. Capacitors, escape. The last part we need is a pSpice ground. So now we're going to space all these out and wire them together with the W key for wire. Let's call this one VCC and VEE. I'm double clicking on these. This will be 15 volts 
This will be minus 15 volts. This can be 5 volts. And then we'll press W again. And double clicking to make these guys end without connecting to something else. Escape. And now to link these guys' nets together, you just hit the N key. Call this VCC. And then you can put it, click right here. It'll only let you place it if it's next to a net. So if I click here, it won't do anything. So these two now are both VCC. And I can do N again and type VEE. -E. But link these guys together. And while I'm at it, I'll label the rest of these. This will be out. This one here we're going to make a little bit bigger, one micro. So it'll charge up a little slower. And then to give it an initial condition, double click on it to get the properties. And here it's already got initial condition uh, listed here. If you didn't see this IC, you just do new property. But since it's already in the list, you can just type negative 5 volts. Now we don't see it on here yet, so you got to double click on it again. Right click. So left click, right click, click display, and then we want name and value. Now we have the initial condition and you can change it just by double clicking from here now. You don't have to go into the properties. If we want to be fancy, we can do these no connects on these two guys. Now that the circuit's all set up, if we want to make a net list, just go to PSPICE, create net list. And now you can view the net list. And here it is. It's just like what we did manually in the previous video. You can see each part. And right here, it's linking to LM741, which is an external model. So that's not being listed in the net list right here. So how is it creating the netlist from the circuit? The key is if you go into the symbol properties here, there is this parameter called pspice template. And that is all that it's doing is it's using its own sort of templating language to convert each symbol that we have here into a line of pspice or block of pspice that's being injected into the netlist. So the pspice template tells the program what the netlist is going to look like that's generated from this symbol. And you can read it here. It says R and then at ref des. This percent one percent two is the pins. And then the question mark is saying if there is this, then do this. Um, otherwise, nothing. So it's saying if there's a tolerance property listed in this symbol, which you can see right here, uh, the tolerance is blank. There's no tolerance property. So it's saying if there's something entered in the tolerance, then you would add it here. But if there's not, then don't. And then here, at value. So when you see something like at and then a, a parameter name, it's going to copy and paste whatever parameter you have here into that spot. So it'll be uh, the value parameter right here. It's going to copy this 1k text and put it right here where it says at value. And then the same for this TC1 and TC2. So uh, if you do list these values, it'll put them in. They'll be 0 right now. And then slash n is for a new line and then it's making a model so it's making the model for this resistor and it's saying res right that's just standard piece by r1 r equals one and then the deviation if you give it a tolerance so that's for 
Monte Carlo analysis. And then here is TC1, TC2 right here. But notice this whole block here with the second line, that's only if there's a tolerance parameter. So in our case, we don't have a tolerance parameter, so it didn't even bother. But that's a way that it automates. If you give it a tolerance, it'll create a model for that part, and it'll inject the tolerance into that. So that's how it's creating that piece spice. And if we go back to piece spice here, you can see R1 gives it the two pins and then the value. And then it does say TC equals, but it's just zero for the two temperature coefficients. The other thing to note is that because you can label any part, anything you want, it always prefixes each part with the type of uh, piece spice code that's required for that type of a part. So for all resistors, it does R underscore and then the name you give it. And that's in case you don't name it something that starts with an R. It needs to make sure that it still starts with an R for piece spice to work. So you don't have to name your parts R if you don't want, like for a transistor or something, you can name it Q or you can name it M or you can just make up a random name and it'll prefix the correct type in front of it like this. But that's another thing to note if you're trying to deal with any of your piece by stuff directly. The parameters are not the names that you see in Capture. They're actually this first letter underscore and then the name. So let's check out this op amp. This is a little different because it's not an elementary part. So it still has this piece by template, but it also has these two. Uh, parts right here, the implementation. Uh, this right here is the name of the PSPICE model that it's using. So this value is generally the same name, and that is just to show on the schematic, but this is not actually linked to anything. This right here is what's going to be copied and pasted in here for whatever reason where it says at model. So if you change this implementation value to a different PSPICE model name, that's going to link a different model to this op amp symbol here. So let's link a custom model. Let's use the one that we downloaded in the previous video. So here's our folder. Right here is the custom model we downloaded before. Here it is. And if we scroll down, the subcircuit name is right here. So I'm just going to copy that and then go back, double click on this guy and change this implementation to this name of that one right there. And now it's linked to the other one. But there's one step that we haven't done yet, which is we have to include that file in the project so that it can find that link but we'll get to that in a second. First, I wanna show you something that took me a while to learn, but ended up being super useful. And that is if you place text, you can click T to place text, the shortcut. There is a keyword. If you type in here at P spice and then colon, and then you press control enter to make a new line. You can type anything you want after this keyword here, and it'll inject it directly into the netlist. So when you do create netlist, it goes through, it checks all of your text files and um, or your text blocks, sees if any of them start with this keyword, and if it does, then it grabs all of the text below and just dumps it straight into the netlist. So this is a super easy way to add things. And this right here, I'll just show a couple of uh, examples of things that you might want to add this way. So first, I'll just prove to you that it works. So we go P Spice Create Netlist, and then P Spice View Netlist, and look at that. So all of this stuff was just dumped right here at the top of the netlist. 
So if we go back here, the first item that's kind of useful is dot include, right? So that's just linking an external library and you can use this format, two dots and then a slash to go back one directory. And in this way, because when you're doing this, you're in sort of deep in this folder tree that Capture has created. If you go out three steps, that gets you back to the main directory where your project is, and then you can call the name of your library file. The next one is options. So if you type dot options, then you can put these standard commands after that. And you can either do like a row for each one. You can do dot options, no reuse, another dot options, conversions aid, that kind of stuff. Or you can just put a bunch of options here uh, separated by spaces. So no reuse is saying uh, don't reuse. If you're doing multiple simulations, don't reuse the results of the previous one as the starting bias guesses for the next one. And then this here is just some automatic convergence helping command. I don't really use that much for anything. The other thing is parameters. You can type dot param and then just put values here and that creates global parameters. So you can call those in functions uh, within the circuit. And then dot IC and dot node set. These are initial conditions and initial guesses. And then you could put as many of those as you want. So this is technically not correct. Uh, here you have to select one or the other so it really should be like this you have a dot ic line you can have initial conditions you have a dot node set line you can have node sets and remember the initial conditions clamp the bias point to that value for that node and the node sets just use an initial starting guess for the algorithm to help it converge so it doesn't clamp the bias point to that value. And then tickle post run, this is an interesting one if you get more into tickle scripting and stuff, you can set it up so that after your simulation is complete it automatically runs a tickle script if you have some kind of post processing you want to do or automation. And then I mean, you can put anything in here. You can put models, you can put sub circuits, you can put other, you know, just circuits that you don't want to draw if you've got something already in text. And then this dot temp here, this is a simulation setting. So this is saying set the simulation temperature uh, to these three values. And when you set it to multiple values, it's actually going to tell it to run three simulations, one at each value. So it's saying run a sweep, one simulation at minus 25, one at 25, and one at 75 degrees C. So here, if we're back to this folder with our special file right here, we can copy this name, but we're actually one more level back because this here is where our project is. So if we want to modify this to link that directly, I'll just paste this in here, but then we also want to copy one more level back of these guys. So we're stepping back one level and we're finding this file right here. So this is going to link that included file up. So there is one problem with doing things this way. This is sort of going outside of the whole capture system, just directly editing the net list. So for example, there's things you can do if you right click on the symbol and go to edit piece by model. Ha, ah, so here it is. And uh, I thought it was going to fail, but it actually worked. <laughs> it found the model right here, the slash ns. But if you look up here, it found it in opamp1.lib, which is not our file. So it looks like the file we downloaded was actually already in part of the default files. So to switch that up, show what's really happening here. Here's this model and we'll give it like a dash new kind of name. This is ours here. Uh, let's, okay, it's just got ends. So it doesn't have the model name after ends. So this looks like the only spot we need to change right here. I'm gonna get rid of this NS. I'm just gonna call it 741 new. We'll copy that, we'll save this file. Then go back in here 
and this one changed to this. So this is for sure not the name of a built-in model. Now, if we edit the pSpice model here, it says could not find the library versus if we have a random one here, and then it shows it in the library. And you can open up whole libraries here and see all the parts. And all it's really doing is just loading a giant text file, but it's automatically clipping out just the text for this one model and it's showing you here. So that's about all the use that this whole model editor is, as far as I can tell. So what I usually do is I don't even use it. I just open the model text files directly and edit them in like Notepad++ or something like that. So now it's time to run our simulation. I'm going to get rid of all the extra stuff here. Just leave this one link. And we need to create a simulation profile by clicking this plus here, new simulation profile. And I'm going to give it a name. I like to just call like transient simulations trans or tran and create that. You'll see pops up over here with the new profile. And it's also in this pSpice resources here under simulation profiles. So this is the new one we made right here. And it looks like there was already an old one that I must have made before called bias. And you can see this tran one is now the default because it's green. So here it is. It's a time domain transient. From the drop down, you can select the different types of simulations. It's going to call it one millisecond. Start saving data after zero seconds, and it doesn't need a minimum step size. And you can just click OK. And now it should be able to click the play button to run it. That automatically brings up this pSpice A to D program. And from here, you can get these probes. And we want to look at the output here. Now, the output is just a solid uh, railed high. So it looks like it's not working as far as the capacitor charging up. And the reason for that is because I totally drew this thing wrong. So what I was trying to do was put this capacitor on this node and just tie this node straight to ground. And that's why this is going to be named zero because the ground node is zero. So let's run that again. And you can see that it still didn't work. And I think this is a polarity problem. So if you look at this guy, see it as number two, if you hover over this pin, number two is on the top. Number one is on the bottom. So to flip that around, I want to click on it, do control X, click up here, control V, and then R twice to rotate it. Now I have to rearrange these reference designators and stuff. Put it back in here. Control S and play. There we go. Now we see the output going along here and charging up. So just a couple of reminders on how this works. You can do more probes here if you want to look at the input versus. So you can see it right when it's crossing over. That's when it's starting to change the output. Uh, we can also do view measurement results and down here is where you can click to add formulas if you want to get measurements on these guys and then you can also right here opens up the simulation profile as well it's the same as doing this one over in capture and from this probe window section here you can tell it if you want it to show uh, based on the probes that you've put or just the last plot so I usually leave it on last plot, and that way you can see these guys right here are the signals we're looking at. If you double click on that, 
and copy that. We can delete these probes off of the schematic. They'll disappear from here. If you click the insert button on your keyboard is the shortcut to add these different uh, signals. So you can do insert V and then just bracket in the name of the node. So we can get the, the P signal back there. And another thing you can do is Windows Display Control. We can give this a standard name to save. So we can just call it standard. And that'll save it down here in case we want to reload this setup later. In case we lose it. But now you can click play from here or from here. And it'll regenerate it and it won't uh, get rid of this stuff. So if we add another signal manually, like we just want to do the VCC line as well. And then we run it again. It won't uh, get rid of the setup now because of the box we checked in the sim settings. So this is connected through here now. You can see if I change this, put some extra characters, and save it and run, get an error here. And when you get an error, what it shows you is the output file. So this is the log file. And that shows cannot open file, right? So it couldn't find this file. So now it's back. And you can also, from here, look at the output file. I don't think you can look at the netlist from here. To look at the netlist, you can go back here to pSpice, view netlist. And then if you want to see how this works in the directories, just go in here to this op amp. It's the name of the project. Um, then schematic. And then you go into this folder here. So this is where you're seeing these uh, files here. This bias sim, that's this uh, simulation set up here. The trans sim, that's the one that we made. And then this here is a folder for all of that simulation settings uh, information. So this is where the actual data file is created. This is the simulation output. This is the circuit file, the output file. And if we go back, this is the netlist right here. So like I was saying in the previous video, the actual netlist is a combination of this circuit file which is the simulation settings right here and this netlist file which is the netlist that we created and this is the included thing that we injected here and then it's also adding in a default library so i'll show you how to add those we we'll go back to the simulation settings and configuration files and library it comes by default with this nom.lib which links in a bunch of stuff so that's how you're able to find these libraries that uh, are sort of automatically linked in so how did we do this legitimately through this interface is by browsing here and we can go back a couple levels need to change this to all files because we want to link this LM741 model file. I always do add to design. There's different ways you can link it to globally designer profile. So now that we've done that, just delete this whole thing. Save that, run it again. Now you can see it ran successfully with the link through the simulation profile. So I want to clarify how this project structure works real quick. These here are your different schematics. And then down here we have the simulation profiles. So you can add multiple ones of these. Like if you want one for an AC analysis, one for transient, you can have multiple transients if you have standard things you want to run. 
and you just right click on them and do make active and that's how you switch between which one you want to run and then the simulations always run on the root and you can see right now this one is the root because make root is grayed out this palette here is just extra stuff so you can have as many schematics as you want on here that are not connected to anything and you can have them also be connected but how it works is they're only used for the p-spice if they're connected to the root so you can have sub circuits and stuff down here that are connected or not connected it depends on if you're using them and linking them to this root schematic the other thing to keep an eye on is your list of libraries over here and your design cache and this one here every now and then if you're getting a lot of complicated stuff adding and deleting you can do clean up the cache but this shows you all the parts and everything that are currently being used in the design you can also see down here is the model that we linked through the simulation profile so now it shows up in this tree structure i'll point out a couple more things in the simulation settings uh, there's a lot to say about convergence but i'm thinking now i'm actually going to save that for another video i'll just make a whole video on convergence but i'll point out a couple things here one is under this options this output file here has a bunch of checkboxes and what that does is it adds more things to the output file so you can uh, do for example this expand and this library and uh, those will add more of the p spice to the output file so then you can see uh, more of instead of just not knowing what's linked it'll copy some of the library files and the expanded piece by information in there or you can just check all these boxes and get a really big output file and uh, that's one way to get a better feel for what the whole thing is doing with the net list all getting woven together for these other options this gate level stuff i don't use that a whole lot transient here you can try these different gear and trapezoidal methods if you're having issues with convergence or it acting weird i usually don't actually need to do that as much i used to use it more here's the settings for the bias point convergence this here pseudo transient is interesting sometimes if you're having trouble with convergence that helps it run uh, a little bit of a transient simulation to try and find a convergent bias point spot then there's also this step gmin and gmin source so it's tries different uh, steps for the source voltage values in the circuit then here is this general i usually don't change this much this limit is one you can try sometimes where you just put like a clamp on any value in the circuit so you could say like a thousand you know i'm not going to have above a thousand volts or a thousand amps this auto converge you can try clicking that or unclicking that this general part here what I like to do for these settings is I usually get rid of this one and then I change TNOM this is the nominal temperature to 25 degrees and these guys I usually make something like 300 200 and 100 this is all stuff just kind of like trial and error you can play around with it and then this guy a lot of times I'll lower so maybe one pico and this guy here sometimes you can lower these guys a little bit i don't like to lower the relative tolerance but like this vo voltage tolerance sometimes you can change that by like a factor of 10 and maybe this one absolute tolerance you can even make that like one nano a lot of times i multiply that by like a thousand from the default uh, that helps and uh, this g -min you can raise up some too but you have to kind of play around with it uh, depending on how your circuit is and it doesn't even always make it better to give it a lower tolerance uh, sometimes 
making a lower tolerance will actually make it not converge, like if you make the relative tolerance real small. So that's all stuff you just have to play around with. So the reason to be clear with the convergence issues is because the way spice and p spice work is with an iterative solution using a least squares algorithm. So what it does is it converts all of these uh, circuit elements into a matrix of functions, like KVL, KCL style functions, and then it tries to solve that matrix with an iterative solution, giving guesses on all the node voltages and uh, the currents through each device, and then uh, running back calculating the errors from all those equations and then using the derivatives uh, to guess the next step and it's changing them all in sort of a intelligent way to try and converge as quickly as possible on the solution that's using i think the newton rapson least squares method uh, i'll try and get into that in more detail in a future video uh, maybe make a video on that and on more details on how to make things converge for complicated circuits. But I think that's enough to get us started with Capture and P-Spice. So thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. Don't forget to subscribe.